Hello and welcome. We are so glad to have you with us, whether you are with us live or watching the replay. My name is Imran and I am excited to be, ex to be hosting this Puzzle Live event, one of many where we will discuss and learn about best practices in teaching and learning. Uh, firstly, a bit about myself. I'm with the Puzzle community team and I work with teachers and schools, especially those in the Asia-Pacific region, to engage their students through the power of video learning. I have a guest with me today. Enoch is a primary school teacher who teaches math and science. He firmly believes that technology will never replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of a great teacher can be transformational. That, uh, those are the words of George Kuros. Enoch loves to learn and try new pedagogies with his class, and he's never satisfied with the status quo. He's eager to share his experiences with anyone who would care to sit down and have a chat with him. So let's say hi to Enoch. Hello, Enoch. How are you today? Uh Good. I'm good. Thanks for having me, Imran. Yeah. How has uh, school been so far? Well, school's been busy, but hanging in there, enjoying it. <laughs> uh, cool, cool. So uh, before we get started, so usually with the uh, panelists I have on this webinar, I play a short game. Uh, we call it Two Truths and a Lie. Maybe some of you have played it before. Uh, so Enoch, I'm going to invite you to share with me three statements. And mm -hmm. you're, gonna, you're not going to tell me which ones are truths and which one is a lie. I'm going to have to try to guess which one is uh, not the truth. Right, so okay. go ahead. Uh, share with me three statements and I'll give it a go. Okay, so statement number one. It is not difficult to build a self-paced classroom. Okay. Statement number That's... two. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I create yeah. all of my videos to allow my class to be self-paced. Okay. Okay, statement number three. I believe that every student is different and they need us to teach them differently. Okay, so uh, mm -hmm. let me just repeat the three statements. Uh, statement number one is it's not difficult to have a self-paced classroom. Yep. Uh, statement number two is that you create all your videos for, mm -hmm. for what was it? What was that again? To allow my class to be self-paced. To allow your class to be self-paced. And number three, what was number three again? Could you repeat that? I believe that every student is different and they need us to teach them differently. Right, right. Okay, every student is different. Um, okay, let's start with the first one. Uh, so I mm -hmm. have tried a self-paced classroom. Uh, I was a teacher for 15 years. Uh, so I did try it in the final two years of my teaching. And I think what, what I found useful was to start slow, start small. So I would say, I guess difficulty is subjective, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that it is a lie because, you know, it's, it's something that if we consider carefully how we want to start off, I think we can, we can quite easily do it. So I would say that uh, the first statement is not a lie. Uh, mm -hmm. Number two is you create all your own videos. Um, okay, so I know some teachers who do. <laughs> so that's a bit subjective. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that. Uh, mm -hmm. But statement number three tells me something. Uh, I think as educators, we, that is ingrained in our beliefs that mm. we know that humans are different. They're intrinsically different. Uh, if yep. teachers have different styles, different, different beliefs, different personalities, then what more students? So I would say mm. that three is definitely true. And therefore, statement number two, where you create all your videos, is probably the lie. Is, is that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> ah, so what do you do then if you don't create all your own videos? Well, I believe nowadays, I mean, in the web, in, in YouTube, we have tons of resources, tons of videos that we can uh -huh. just curate. But I think the key is that you have to curate because not every video is suitable. Um, but definitely, there will be some resources that are suitable for us to use. And if we can't find any suitable ones, then we create our own. But you don't really need to create everything. Okay. Yeah, that takes up a bit too that. much time, yeah. Yeah, it does, it does. <laughs> uh, and as teachers, you know, we, we, we really feel that, you know, we, we want to be as efficient as possible. Uh, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's get to it. So we're here to talk about self-paced classrooms. What is it? Why we should have it? And how uh, we should build a self-paced classroom. So Enoch, take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Wow, glad to see all of you here. Um, just before I start, if you would like a copy of the slides or you want to follow along with me or just... Because we're talking about self-paced, right? So I can't expect everybody to be following along the slide by slide. So if you would like to go a bit faster, please go ahead. Or if you need to recap, so that's why I put the link to the slides over there. You can scan the QR code and that should bring you to the slide. So I'll give you like 10 seconds to take the, the QR code, take it down so you can get the slides. 
Now, if you would also like to reach out to me after this session to talk about a little bit more about how we build self-paced classroom or just talk about learning in general, my email is there. Feel free to email me as well. So okay. for, our, for our attendees on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, uh, I have just put in the URL to the slide deck so you could uh, take a look at it at your own time. Okay, okay. go ahead, Enoch. Let's go. So now let's always start with the why. So why do we need a self-paced classroom? Now, but before I, I jump in, I just want to share a, another bit of resource for you to go and do your own reading, your own learning. And this is from Cult of Pedagogy. I think some of you are very familiar with this website. A very good uh, resource place for learning. And they also mention about self-paced classrooms. So please go, feel free to go and take a look at it. Uh, I will mention a little bit about what I've read from that website as well. Okay, so the key to why students need a self-paced classroom, and that is what I alluded to just now in my third statement, and that is everyone is different. Every student is different. Even we ourselves, we learn at a different pace. And I think we owe it to our students to look at them individually and customize our learning to suit their needs. Of course, we have those who are on task, right? Like the girl you see in the middle, the ones that are on task. Uh, we have those that are a lot faster. And then we need to think how can we stretch them so that they can fly even further, even higher. And always we have that group of students who are always puzzled. Yeah, lots of question marks in their head. They need more time to learn. But unfortunately, we have been trained, or rather I, when I was in, in, in training as a teacher, they always teach us to teach to the middle because it's just impossible to help everybody. So you teach to the majority, which hopefully is the middle, and let the rest survive on their own, so to speak. But we know that it's not the reality. Not every student have the support they need. Not every student is able to learn on their own. And so we as teachers need to think how can we create that learning for them. And I think most of you are familiar with uh, differentiated learning, right? And in differentiated learning, we learn that we can differentiate according to the content, process, product and learning environment, according to their readiness, interest and learning profile. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is really how can we differentiate the process so that everybody takes their own pace. And that is according to the readiness. And the reason why we need to cater to the pace of the students is because every student comes in at different readiness. And so the website Card of Pedagogy defined self-paced classroom as such. Right? I'll leave it to you a, a short while to read it up. But I'm going to summarize it in just one sentence, just in case it's just too many words for us. Right? So a self-paced classroom, in my definition, it is a place where students progress at their own pace. And that's very important right? because that traditional lecture-style lessons that we have always been used to and some of us are still doing now, it doesn't cater to their pace. It doesn't allow students to work at their own pace. Oftentimes, students are working at our pace and we are working at a certain pace which may not cater to everybody. Yeah? So, there will be a lot of buts. Okay, I've heard this before. Mm, I know self-paced learning is good. But how? How can I teach so many different concepts in just one lesson? If student A is at, say, the first concept, student B is at the second concept, student C is at the third concept, that's quite impossible because as a teacher, if I need to do a lecture, how do I lecture three different types of lesson, right? So that is a lot of, mm, I, I don't understand how to do it. And that is where technology comes in. So technology has allowed us to do a lot of things previously we can't do it. Yeah, If you were to tell this to a teacher maybe 10, 20 years ago, they would say that it's impossible. But now with YouTube, and even right now, we are just doing this live on using technology, right? It's a, it's a possibility to create your own videos and allow students to watch different videos at different times. Now, you will see this, this last thing called student learning space. So for our friends from other countries, the student learning space, I will be sharing some examples about student learning space. And this is basically a learning management system that we here in Singapore, uh, that every school in Singapore has access to. And there are a lot of resources in student learning space. And so that's why the lie where you need to create all your content, your, all your videos, that's a lie because 
um, there are abundant resources. And here in Singapore, we're actually very lucky because the student learning space has tons of materials, resources, videos, uh, simulations, and what you have you not to allow our students to learn really at their own pace. So having talked about why, let's talk about how. How do we create that self-paced classroom? And again, some people might be scratching their head. Oh, it sounds so daunting. It sounds so difficult, right? But as Imran has mentioned, not too difficult because I'm going to share with you the first method and I'm going to be sharing just two methods. One, the more easy, the easier path. And the second one is slightly more advanced, right? So the first one um, is... Some... So, you know, you know, so yes. would you recommend that uh, teachers who are looking to get started on having self-paced classrooms, should they mm -hmm. start off with your first method and then maybe they try the second method after they have had some experience? Yes, definitely. Okay, so let's listen into the first method and then mm. we'll see whether that is bite-sized enough for most teachers. And then let's see whether we can grow that in the second method. Go ahead. Yep. And I, I recommend that because that was also the journey that I took. I started off with this thing called flip learning and then I'm moving on to the second method, which I will mention a little bit later. So in flipped learning, it's and I don't think flipped learning is something very foreign to a lot of us now, especially with the pandemic, where we had to suddenly shift the way we learn, where our students were all learning from home. Essentially, that's what flipped learning entails, where at home, they are watching a video to learn a certain concept. And so you can see in the picture of, in, in my slide, you can take one from YouTube. The one below is from YouTube. The one above is the one that I created. So it's really up to you. Yeah, you can create your own, you can get from YouTube. But essentially what happens is your students are learning at home. And because they are at home, they can take their own time. So I have students who enjoy that because they tell me they can repeat the video over and over again until they get it. Or they can choose where they want to learn. Some of them, they prefer learning on their bed where it's more comfortable. Some of them prefer learning on the couch or in the bus or whatever it is, right? Or they can choose the time that they, they want to learn. Not everybody's a morning person. Some of us prefer the evenings. And so my students, they can learn it in the evening. Some prefer in the morning. It's really up to them. Yeah, so that's what we mean by self-paced in, in that sense. And then when they come to lesson, ah, that's where they apply the learning. Now you can take this to another level because we're talking about self-paced classroom. So how do you factor flipped learning into the classroom? Well, if you have the device in your class and you have enough device for every student, you can actually get them to be watching the videos in class itself. Yeah? And then immediately they apply their learning. And so that is also another way to do it rather than waiting for them to go home and finish it and come to class. Yeah. So I learned that um, that, that second variation where they are mm -hmm. watching the videos in class, uh, I mm -hmm. learned that the term for that is called in flip. Sorry, in-class flip. In-class flip, yeah. And that might be useful for some of the educators here who might be wondering, but, you know, we don't have uh, remote learning anymore. We don't have situations where students, like in the past two years, where students stay at home, uh, all of them have to, have to come back to school. So I mm -hmm. think um, the thing that we can take away from this is uh, not that it's the location that's important. It's the mm -hmm. idea that you are allowing the students to progress at their own pace. Um, in the past, we used to get them to stay at home, but if, even now, when students have to be in class, you can still flip the learning experience by having them access the learning activities at their own time. Yep. Okay. Definitely. Now, the other way that I do flip learning, and this is maybe quite uh, peculiar to Singapore. I, I don't know about the other countries whether uh, they, we do you you guys do this because here in Singapore we have quite a bit of standardized testing. Yeah, we do a lot of exam preparation, and so one of the the issues with exam preparation is we will give our students what we call a revision paper, which usually is a past year a previous year's exam paper for them to practice uh, to get used to how the exam will be like. Now, but the problem with this is when you want to go through it, because we still want our students to learn from that experience, right? When you do the, the exam paper, the previous year's exam paper, and the teachers will mark. Uh, the problem is when you get back your paper as a student, I have, say, maybe 10 questions. Maybe I only have five questions that I got wrong. The other five, I understand perfectly. I know it already. Now, but the problem is as a teacher, what, what do you do? So usually the traditional method, and that was where I started as well, 
I would look at all my students and I would pick out questions that I think most of them made mistakes in, right? Which means most or majority of the students in the class are struggling with this question or this concept. And then in class, I will go through it. Now, this poses a few problems. One, those students that already mastered this concept, they will find it very boring and very meaningless because I already understood the concept. I got the answer correct. Why do I still need to sit there and listen to my teacher explaining the, the thing that I already know? Second problem, how about students who got maybe eight questions wrong? I only go through the five questions. How about the other three? No one is going to go through the answer with them. They will have no clue why this is wrong and they will not be able to correct their mistakes. And then we throw them into the exams expecting them to do well. So that doesn't seem right. So for exam prep, what we do, and, and it's not just me, quite a lot of my colleagues in, in my school, they, we, we enjoy this because what we do is we record ourselves explaining every single question. Now, this is one that we need to record. Unfortunately, you won't find this in YouTube because this is very peculiar to my school or your school's paper. So you need to put in the hard work to record every single question. Now, the good thing is now as a student, they can pick and choose because they have like a buffet in front of them, question one to question 10. As a student, I choose. Let's say I got one, three, five wrong. I just need to go to question one, question three, and question five listen to the teacher explaining, and then I get it and I can move on and I can move on to do other things. While the students who get eight questions wrong can really work at his or her own pace to go through all eight questions and get a good understanding of the concepts. Now, uh, some of you may think, hmm, but won't the, the child just, or won't the student just watch it or just plug it in? Like what a lot of our kids do, right? They just plug in and just uh, float around the room or they just let it play as if it's some uh, YouTube video. So what we do is, if you look at the, the image on the right, I put in this thing called bonus questions. So these bonus questions are very similar questions to what the question, the actual question is. So it's a reinforcement of the, of the concept. Or for math, I can just tweak the numbers a little bit just to make sure that they truly understood the concepts. And if they get the bonus question wrong, that is an indication that they still don't understand. And that is where me as a teacher can go in. Now, remember, my students are doing this all in the classroom. I don't get them to go home and do it for one very important reason, because I need to be there. So I always tell my, my friends that essentially in this manner, we actually clone ourselves. I can clone myself to the number of students because I have videos. So let's say I got 40 students. I clone myself 40 times and actually I am the 41st person because everyone is just watching me, right, on their device. Me, the physical presence, I can then roam around. One, to check, make sure they're on task. Two, if they have questions. Because face it, not every student can really get information or understand from a video. And there are limitations to how a video works because video is flat, Right? Some students will still need you to point out to them or show it to them or explain to them face-to-face. -face. And when I do it in class this way, that allows my students that opportunity to raise their hands and ask for more explanation, for more help. Okay. So What, what I like about that is that hmm. uh, because during revision, maybe some students, they have done a bit more, maybe some have done a bit less, and therefore they can choose. Uh, mm -hmm. it's not a standard set for everybody. They can pick and choose. Maybe they know a for a certain topic, they're a bit weaker. So gonna mm -hmm. they're going to choose questions more from that topic. Uh, so I think that that selection by the students, giving them the choice, I think that can be quite powerful. Yep. So this is how my students look like when they are doing their work. All right. So everybody on their own device, they put on their headphones so that they don't get distracted. Okay. Now, so that is flip learning. Not too difficult. But yet, there is something missing in the element of flip learning, and which is why, and I'll explain a little bit more later on. So the next stage is what we call flipped mastery. Now, why do we go into flipped mastery? Is because sometimes when you go through flipped learning, uh, at the end of, after you finish everything, the end of the year, when they take an assessment or you check with them, the understanding, and then they come back, you have already gone through the entire unit. 
you've done all the videos, you've answered all the questions, but yet you have not learned anything, right? And the question that we also want to ask is, wait, what have you mastered? And so that's why we move into what we call flip mastery. So I'm going to add on to my definition of a self-paced classroom that it's not just students progressing at their own pace, but they progress at their own pace only when they've shown mastery of the concept so that they don't just breeze through the whole topic without showing any real understanding. Yeah, And that's what we want as teachers, to really help them to show understanding, to make sure they master it before they can move on. Yeah? Okay, so how do I do it? Now, there are many ways of doing flip mastery. Okay, uh, you can go and check out books. I know uh, the pioneer of flip learning, uh, Mr. Jonathan Bergman, he just published a book entirely on flip mastery. So I encourage you to go and get the book if you're really interested into it. What I'm sharing is just one way in which I do flip mastery. And I use this model called the I know, I do, I check. And this is adapted from a few different sources. Okay, so let me very quickly run through the whole process with you. Huh? So my students will start with the I know part. So the I know is really learning the concept. So that's the, the flip, flip learning part, right? They learn via a video uh, and using a learning, learning management system. So what you see in the picture there is our student learning space, our Singapore's learning management system. So that allows me to spot possible learning issues. We call this the heat map because if you see if those in red, it's like mm, alarm bells. Okay, this fella still needs help and I can go and help that person. So this stage is for them to know and understand the concept. And oftentimes, I get my students to take notes as well because I don't want them to be passive learners. So it's important that as you watch a video, you write down, you take notes. And so that's important. Now, after they know, they have some idea of the concept, the next stage is to apply it, right? And that's what we always do. We get our students to apply their learning. And so they apply their learning by doing, by practicing, uh, answering questions. And the, the key here is I need to make this process automated, okay? Because what happens most of the time is when you do, after you finish doing, the students has to wait for the teacher to finish marking, right? And then after that, somehow you, the teacher will have to go through the, the mistakes that you've made. That process slows down and that hinders a self-paced uh, learning style. So what I do is I use technology again to get students to check their answers. Now, I know this is not possible for all subjects and for certain type of questions, especially the more open-ended ones, this may not work. So this works very well for closed type of question. Yeah, and closed meaning like, for example, math is just a number. They can check whether their answer is correct or wrong. Yeah, uh, For multiple choice questions, that's possible as well because there are, there's only just one possibility. So this works only for those more closed-ended type questions. And again, what you see there, this answer checker, uh, I give you two examples. One, the first one on top is the learning management system in Singapore as well, our Singapore our student learning space. Uh, but you can also use any learning management system. The one below that you see there is a Google Form. So before we had the student learning space, I made use of Google Forms to help get my students to check answers. Yeah. And so in this a lot stage, of, uh, hmm. sorry. Uh, so a lot of learning management systems, they also have auto grading so mm -hmm. if your school or district, they, they're using common ones uh, and you're using a certain tool where you can uh, auto-grade uh, multiple choice questions like this, that would be uh, the easiest for you. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would say, I, I just want to add in, uh, definitely mm -hmm. this is the easiest because it means that you, know, you don't have to uh, look at all the answers one by one manually. That kind of defeats the purpose of you know, letting them progress at their own pace. But uh, mm -hmm. once in a while, I, I liked to... Uh, put in some open-ended questions. Uh, not too many because I would like them to think a bit deeper as well. So, of mm -hmm. course, this would mean that there has to be a bit more involvement on your part as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Okay, so after they have checked their answers, they have sort of a, uh, an okay understanding and that's where we move on to the last part and this is the more important part and that's what we call mastery check. So again, you can make use of a whole host of tools. Uh, the Student Learning Space is one, you Google Form. There's this tool called Quizalize, where it really does what we have been talking about, where it only allows students to progress when they got like 80% correct, something like that. 
Uh, I know of um, other ways of doing this is through rubrics. So for more open-ended type uh, content, you can actually use rubrics to get students to check and make sure they have cleared the mastery check. Or they can actually come to you and you can assess their understanding before you say, okay, you are okay, you can move on. Yeah? So there are many ways to build the mastery check, uh, but it's important that you have a system in place to check their understanding, to check their mastery before they move on to the next concept or the next topic, right? So to put it all together again, back to this, this slide. So the I know part, our student, my students will first start by watching a video. Now, I, I put here, you can also do small group teaching and that's possible as well. So some self-paced classroom, they do it in a station rotation method. So that's another thing you can explore. I've never done this, but we can explore that. So watching the video, learning it on their own, moving on to the practicing and the checking. And then finally, they do the mastery check. Now, but the mastery check is important. It's interesting because if, let's say, you don't clear the mastery check, you fail it. You, it shows the child, the student, that they need more practice. They need to work on it more. They need to ask more questions. And then they can always come back to try again. And that iterative method is important because it allows the students to grow in their own understanding of the concept. And only when they clear it and they pass it, and that is like the badge of honor, then they can move on to the next topic. And so that is the whole flip mastery concept that, uh, that I've been using quite often with my students. Now again, for those in Singapore, uh, I, I know there are some Singapore uh, teachers here. Um, the good thing about our student, uh, student learning space, SLS, is that it allows us to stitch everything together in a course. So that is very, very useful because then, uh, so you, what you can see here is my topic on time. I, they, my students need to learn these four concepts, time in hours and minutes, duration, units of time, and 24-hour clock. So I can stitch them all together. So if your learning management system allows you to do that, then that would be so, I mean, a lot more useful rather than having it all in, in sporadic places. So organization is important for your students as well. I know uh, of some who use Google Docs where they list everything down, yeah, or you can use a website. So there are many ways of doing it, but important to organize your content so that it's easy for students to go in, right? So lesson learned is keep everything in one place. Um, mm -hmm. When I try this out, I just use a spreadsheet, right? So everything is mm -hmm. hyperlinked. All the information is there. The rubrics are there. Everything is just in one document and students just need to go down the document mm. uh, for the course progress. Uh, yep. So it doesn't matter which elements you use, as long as there is like, uh, students know there is one place they need to go to when they need to access this. Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, again, for those in Singapore, teacher marked quiz is what I use. So this is how I do my mastery check. So you can see here, uh, those who don't do well, I will get them to redo again. So that's the usefulness of the teacher marked quiz in SLS. Okay, now, so I, I know some of you will start asking, but with everyone working at their own pace, how do we keep track? Because it's just one of me, right? And so keeping track is also something very important because you don't want a student to suddenly be lagging behind and then you only realize at the end of the year that this person only cleared the first topic, right? So you need to keep track. And it's also important to keep track because you need to pace them. Unfortunately, most of our curriculums, and I don't think it's just here in Singapore, uh, all over the region, we all have a fixed set of curriculum that we need to cover and our students need to progress. Yeah, they cannot be stuck at that same concept for maybe five years. It's not possible. They need to progress. Yeah, so it's important for keeping track and it is also useful to then uh, nudge our students and say, hey, you are only on the first concept. You need to move on. So what I do is I also, also give like very hard deadlines. I say by today or by this week, you need to complete say topic one, topic two. So that at least the students know that I, yes, it's self-paced, but it's not, you, you, you cannot fully self-paced to the point that they really take their own sweet time because some students will take advantage of it and will not progress on, yeah? So what I do is I have two kinds of checklists. The first one is a checklist for students. So this is for them to have a, a sense of where they are and where they need to go. So if you look here at my, uh, so this is, I print this as hard copy and I paste it into their books so that it's easy for them to refer. So you can see here my goal. So it also allows them to set, okay, so maybe today I need to finish this, tomorrow I need to finish that. And then they check on their own 
once they've completed. And then me as a teacher will be that second round of checking to just make sure that they've cleared everything, especially the mastery check, they've cleared it and they're good to go. Yeah. So on my end, I will use a spreadsheet. So this is really for me to check and make sure that the students have completed or I know who has completed what and so it also allows me to approach them and you see the one right at the bottom, this person only finished the first mission, the first lesson. And so this person needs to progress a little bit faster. He needs to put in a little bit more work. Yeah. And so that's it. So moving from flip learning to flip mastery and that's how we do it. So um, attendees, uh, if you have questions, please uh, type in your questions in the comments uh, and uh, we'll get Enoch to answer them. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask Enoch a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what is one piece of advice you would give to educators who are looking to start something mm -hmm. like this next week? What's, what's next like week? just one thing that they should do? Or the I first the thing first, they should do? Yeah. I think the first thing that you should do is, wow, next week. I guess start slow. So like I mentioned, doing the flip learning and trying the in-flip, uh, in-class flip is actually useful because it gets students um, ready to learn using technology. I don't think all our students know, and, and teaching your students how to watch video is also a skill. Nah? We always assume our kids being that digital natives, that they've been consuming tons of content online. They know how to watch a video. Yes, they know how to watch a YouTube video, this person jumping off the cliff. They can watch those. That's brainless type videos. But watching an instructional video learning from the video, taking notes if you need to, that's a skill you need to teach. And so if you really want to start, get a video. Again, you don't have to create your own. You can get a video that has already been done. You can create the video and teach your students how to watch it. So what I do is usually at the start of the year is I will watch the video with my students and I'll tell them, okay, at this point, you need to pause. Why? Because you need to start thinking about certain things. You need to start taking notes. So I'll teach them what it means to pause the video. I'll also teach them what it means to rewind. I don't assume everybody knows how to re rewind the video because they would be wondering, why do I need to rewind a re video? It's th the purpose is you need to learn and to see if I missed out this part, I can rewatch it again. Yeah, so that's one way to start watching it in class. And then after that, progress to every student have, your, have their own device uh, and, and watching it in class itself. That gives them the habit of watching a video that will then propel you to doing the flip learning and flip mastery that we talked about. Yep. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, so firstly mm -hmm. from Jessa. Thanks for your question, Jessa. Uh, she's asking, what is the best motivational strategy to motivate mm. unmotivated learners to practice independent learning? Uh, I think we, we all have had this kind of student where we, we try to imbue them with the autonomy, but maybe they just don't want to. So how might we motivate them just a bit more? You know, honestly, when you talk about motivation, um, a lot of people think that technology is that silver bullet that will motivate the students. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't see that. Because to, uh, motivation is it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a whole other topic that we can d uh, dive into. Motivation stems a lot on times, not just with the students, but with their background, their learning ability. Um, yeah, there's so many issues. So to me, the best motivational strategy is to get to know your student. Because once you know your student, you will know what makes them tick, right? And when we talk about differentiated learning also, we talk about differentiating according to their interests. So it could be that the topic is not as interesting to the students. And then how can we tweak the topic to cater to their needs. So let's say you're learning um, composition writing uh, in, and you know that that student loves, say, soccer. Maybe you can put in examples of soccer. That might help the students to be motivated, right? So the important thing is to get to know your student. And the good thing about flip learning, flip mastery, and whatever the things that we've been talking about, the self-paced classroom, is that it frees up time for you as the teacher to get to know your students, which is something that we could never do if we are right in front lecturing most of the time, right? Because we're just too busy lecturing. By the time you finish lecturing, time is almost up. Yeah, but when you flip your learning, when students are learning at their own pace, that allows you to go in and sit down next to that child and say, hey, 
What is wrong? How can I help you? And to me, that is the best motivational strategy. No amount of technology can motivate our students. It is we, as teachers, when we connect with them at the heart level, that is how we motivate our students. I mean, I hope I've answered the question. <laughs> so actually, somebody else asked a similar question. So Yongwei, hmm. a question about uh, problems with students who refuse to watch videos. I hope that answers uh, your question as well. And uh, Enoch, just now I noticed one of your resources, you labeled the tasks as mission one, mission two. Uh, hmm. So I'm, I'm guessing that's to just make it a bit more exciting, a bit like you know, they're completing a mission and not just doing uh, classwork. Yep. Um, let's, let's go to one last question um, mm -hmm. uh, because of time. Uh, the question is from Yongwei and his question, his, his or her question is, what kinds of notes do you get your students to take for math? Mm. This is about uh, note taking and how mm. do you teach them to take such notes? Okay, so for, it really depends on the topic, yeah, but most of the time it will be like say formulas, that things that they really need to remember so for, yeah, so math, we have lots of formulas. So that's one thing you, I, I get them to take down. Uh, the second thing I get them to take down is the working. That means examples of how to solve it. And how, why, why is that, why that is important is because when they are practicing similar questions, if they are stuck, uh, what I will do is I'll tell them, go back to your notes, refer to it first. Again, I refrain from jumping in and being the superhero to save them all the time. They need to learn how to fish for themselves, so to speak, right? So they need to go back to the notes and say, okay, oh, this is how it was done, right? And if they are still really a bit confused, I'll tell them, go back to the video again, watch it again. So the resources are all there for our students and that's what we need to teach them. And if they're really, 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 really stuck at the end, that is where we come in and say, okay, now this is how you do it. Yeah, so basically the notes will be formulas as well as some examples of uh, what, or how to solve, how to apply the formula. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so what I also find useful is to ex explicitly teach all these um, soft skills or studying skills. Sometimes when students are doing something for the first time, something they're not used to, maybe they don't know how they should be learning. So I think how to learn is, mm. is, is worthwhile for you to be teaching such skills too. Uh, that's what I feel. Uh, so I just have a few comments here, not quite questions. Um, Alexis is asking, there are some students who fast forward and they mm -hmm. skip to the end of the video where they get the answer. So uh, she, she has addressed this, he or she has addressed this in the class. Um, so if you use a tool like Edpuzzle, you are able to uh, toggle on the feature where students cannot skip past the question. So they have to mm. uh, address a question before you continue. Uh, somebody is asking, Eva, Eva EDU is asking, how do we create a heat map if we don't have Singapore's uh, student learning space? So even for Google Forms, when you have the responses from the students, uh, you have that in a Google Sheet, something like a spreadsheet. So if you know some conditional formatting, uh, it's not that uh, difficult to learn. You can look it up on YouTube. You can look it up on our website. If you know how to do conditional formatting, you can uh, kind of code it such that yes. certain questions will come up as green, some will come up as red, and that gives you like an overall picture of how the class is doing. Uh, the same person is asking, will this session be recorded for replay? So the, if you're on YouTube right now, uh, it is the same link. So it will be on YouTube and you can just bookmark that and you can watch or you can share the link. If you're on Facebook Live, same thing. Um, the Facebook Live video is there and you can uh, watch it or share the link with others if you would like to. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so mm. much, Enoch, for your time. And I hope our attendees have learned as much as I have and that they continue to empower their students and give them a voice. Uh, now, next month, on uh, 16th of November, I will be having another webinar with an educator from the Philippines, and we'll be talking about homework. So we'll be, we'll be asking, do we ditch homework? Do we keep homework? What's the value of homework in the classroom? So Absolutely. if you're interested in that, <laughs> if you're interested in that, you can uh, look out for the promotional materials. It'll be on the 16th of November. So we've been Enoch and Imran. You've been great. Till next time, everyone. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.